piece that is uh, situated at the moment. Um, within the Loon Gallery is um, intended as a meditative uh, piece that is also best described as a mourning piece in relation to the extinction of this particular rush, which uh, is also known as the Ronak Rush or the Rush of the Pollock Bog. Um, and it's uh, an extinct species in Ireland. Um, the name of the rush itself, the Ronak or the Rush of Pollock, um, relates actually to the locations that it has been found. So the Ronach Rush is the name that it was inherited from its location in Scotland in the peatlands um, there. And also then in Offaly, it's related to the, the Pollock Rush. And essentially around the 1950s, uh, this particular uh, bog was being industrialized, um, typical of many of the Midland bogs at, the partic at, at that particular time. And an eminent uh, Irish biologist, um, Professor John Moore, who was actually a Jesuit priest and quite well known both in Ireland, but also internationally for his work on what essentially is plant family psychologies, so to speak, sociologies, um, so to speak. And he actually wanted to save this particular rush, but and transferred it to another location, but unfortunately uh, it didn't survive. And I guess the invite from Loon to create a piece in response to, to, the, to the group show around climate, um, climate action, climate change. Um, it made sense then, then to think, as I am also from Westmead, to think about what are the kind of uh, conditions that are available to us um, in relation to mourning or saying goodbye, so to speak, to um, particular species that um, have become extinct. And this work, uh, I guess is rooted in a couple of years now of practice um, that mainly is articulated as well in this journal from 2016, uh, this article that I wrote, which was looking at artistic practices in, in relation to, I guess what I was broadly calling at the time, uh, li liquid loss, which has other sort of theoretical meanings as well. But um, specifically, I was using the phrase to think through this notion of how do we sort of learn or mourn companion and, and, and landscape species loss. And at this particular time um, in 2016, also, I guess there was, a, I, I live and work also in Bristol, there was a lot of, I guess, the pre-extinction rebellion uh, work happening here in, in the city and in the region. And, um, and I had been thinking, I guess, about the, ways in which we legitimize um, grieving practices in general, particularly um, how we have su such developed rituals for human loss in various different cultures, obviously, that um, and Ireland, I think, well known for almost the wake and the whole process that we have of saying goodbye to uh, dear and loved ones. And I and and so this kind of combination of thinking through these ideas really was where this backstory sort of came through for um, this particular piece um, as well. And um, and also I guess to sort of reference what was happening with my work at this particular time, I had uh, I was also beginning to sort of set up this practice-led studio and research program called Repair Acts, which looks to fostering um, more restorative cultures by connecting what we 
did in the past with what we do, do today to how we envisage the future. And a lot of this was also situated around what we would call and broadly call material cultures and looking at ways um, that our material cultures can lead to processes of restorative practices and a more uh, thoughtful and careful, mindful way to kind of, I guess, live um, on the earth at this particular time, as we are in these also very, uh, you know, urgent climate scenarios that we're experiencing and that's kind of quite clear from not only the news and the media but also the science reports now for several decades and the kind of urgency around policy shift that's happening at this moment in time and I think that the, the very felt ways that this is also emerging in terms of particular concerns or eco and anxieties and I have also a background in psychology. So this notion of like how to address particular anxieties that I sort of um, was observing, seeing, witnessing, hearing and listening um, through these different kind of um, climate groups that I was involved in and also students uh, who I was uh, teaching for example and, um, and 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 many manifestations really of I guess what does one do how does one respond what is legitimate response in this particular kind of context so I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a sort of a backstory to the types of thinking and the threads that were informing this particular amalgamation of work then that I started to kind of explore and find myself in. And drawing back on that article from 2016, I was also kind of quite influenced by a whole bunch of what would be called eco-feminist scholars or extinction scholars, those that are also working in kind of thinking through degrowth, that this particular kind of uh, phrase really that the world tells a big story and that we are in this period at this moment in time, it's called to call the sixth extinction, where these living arrangements that took millions of years to kind of put into place are sort of been undone, so to speak, in the blink of an eye. And 2016 also marked another scholar's work, Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble. This particular book came out at the time. And the turn of phrase itself, Staying with the Trouble, I think kind of captured uh, a, a, a zygote at that time in relation to thinking, well, if this is what we are living in, if this is the trouble, aka this environmental uh, unraveling uh, the derangement of of these living relationships. If this is sort of what hap is happening, and this ex sixth extinction is 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 what we're witnessing, experiencing, living through, then what are the new ways and habits of living that can sort of help uh, kind of hold on in this trouble? And that's also uh, you know aspects of what I was thinking of um, when I began to think through what does it mean to create mourning spaces and ritualized practices and behaviors that normalize processes of grief or loss or the felt bodily somatic um, reactions that people are having, but they kind of don't know what to do with them. Uh, because maybe some people don't recognize eco anxiety, or maybe some people think that it's all in your head, or maybe somebody thinks you're too sensitive. And how then do we sort of um, acknowledge that this is happening, acknowledge that this is a legitimate response, and create context through which then it can sort of be received? So that it's not pathologized and becomes, you know, neuroses and other sort of um, other sort of other manifestations that may not necessarily be helpful to an individual or to us as a group of humans going through this kind of uh, scenario that we're living in at the moment. And so I started to really research then these kind of notions of the ecologies of grief and kind of 
theories of grief and theories of um, uh, processes of grief, grief counseling. And I was quite struck here by uh, Windle's work. Windle is a, an American thinker, writer, um, eco psychologist. You know, you're starting to begin to see the early forms of what is now climate psychology or eco psychology kind of coming through in the late 90s, um, early 90s, late 90s. And this particular article that I ha was reading of hers had sort of uh, expressed how, you know, within hospitals, within religious groups, within many cultures, that we often sort of uh, acknowledge that seeing the body, yeah, aka the Irish wake, um, is a really important part of the protocols of kind of grieving, yeah, and that it that the, the this. This, these protocols of grieving then drew me down into sort of a period of work where I was looking at how different cultures carry out funeral processions, so to speak. And what Windle is actually drawing on here is she's mourning actually the loss of the dogwood um, trees that are in her neighborhood, yeah? And she's reminiscing on this and kind of going, what is the legitimate response? You know, should I look for the kind of the crumbles of the leaves, the bark? Should I pick up something? You know, you know, if I if I want to kind of like legitimize it, how do I sort of grieve? OK, so she was posing this question. And so artistically, this is where I started to think through what this also could mean in building, cultivating, designing, performing and practicing certain types of um, artifacts and elements that could actually think through this notion really in a way. Um, and sort of supporting this then kind of went into a period as I mentioned of kind of looking at how theoretically also grief had been um, understood. And there's very clear sort of, I don't want to say they're clear, but there's acknowledged markers. There's, um, four stages of grief, five stages of grief, six, seven, it depends on which theoretical framework you're looking at, it depends on what the, you know, the research orientation, but there's a sort of often sort of, um, I wouldn't say linear, but sort of process over time that we kind of go through where there is this, you know, first the, the shock or the numbness, um, the uh, yearning, the searching, the sort of the despair, the disorientation. Parker and Bowles are sort of some of the first people to really um, explore this sort of phases really in a way. And much of their work has been built on with different counselors like um, Kub Kubler-Ross here, also speaking to how um, these can then be um, expressed within counseling sort of uh, contexts as well. And so you get the sort of these lines of, 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 of the phases also referring to kind of in other models, denial perhaps in the first phase or anger in the second phase as well, um, or essentially though there's these early stages of, of shock and, and kind of uh, numbness and, and the app that emotive. And then one starts to actually then kind of, you know, let go of the grief and, and do and, 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 and look towards the sort of, perhaps when you, you may withdraw or you might feel like, okay, I need to kind of come down a bit after that main emotion to then come through this period of reorganization, re, re recovery, acceptance, et cetera. And, and this is also manifested then in therapeutic contexts where, you know, um, one might be guided through these processes as well in terms of, re of, of again, uh, the six, six dimensions of, of mourning that uh, the, the clinical psychologist and counsellor uh, Teresa Randall also kind of looks at with these notions of kind of recognising, reacting, they're often called the, the, the six R's, uh, recollecting, relinquishing, readjusting, reinvesting. And again, this tear, the tear, the tear drop in a sense also follows a counseling process too of acceptance and adjusting and reinvesting. So what I was finding was that there were these not only culturally significant ways in many, 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 many cultures that we deal with death, a human death, um, 
processes, funeral rights, laws, legislations of how to deal and govern with the body. And then we have also these, you know, canons of, of, of research and work and, and counselling processes that guide us through essentially what happens when we deal with human loss. But then I was going back to the same question of kind of like, well, what happens though when that loss is not visible and it is felt in relation to a tree or a lake or a mountain or the bees in your neighborhood, yeah? And so then I start, this is kind of where this work was sort of like kind of leading me, me to. And I guess all of this was sort of happening prior uh, COVID and, and during then COVID and this kind of great silence almost that came about with it, um, other work which I was doing, which was also kind of looking at relationships between how we connect to the material environmental impact of our technologies and, and, and the, the energy consumption of those, I started to create these performances, I would say, that guided people through the material, mineral, earthly substances that make up their computers and, and their devices. And I was doing this because we couldn't physically meet through processes of guided visual meditation, um, which is going to kind of inform essentially the workshop that I'll do at Loon on the 2nd of September. And so these processes then were sort of modalities of storytelling where I would essentially research and look through what all of the components that made up, for example, your laptop and then create this performance that was online that also allowed you to bring in these different elements through which you were also then providing also provided an opportunity to sort of like bless and cleanse your tech and allow you to sort of perhaps accept or banish some modal modes of communication that might not have been good, but could also have been extremely positive and allowed you perhaps to connect to people that you wouldn't normally be able to connect to, et cetera. So it was connecting here, these different kind of aspects, both of daily use, material, mineral composites that are in our tech. And the plant here that you also see is the Guta per Percha tree, which is actually um, a, a tree that, has a very strong latex that actually covered all of the early Victorian telecommunication lines that actually were the were laid across the the, the sea cables basically, but became the kind of foundations through which we then overlaid our 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 digital um, uh, fiber optic cables and and te later telecom later internet cables and other telecom cables as well but this particular tree was completely almost wiped out as a result of the growth of the the, the telegraph in, in, in industry back in 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 the late 1800s uh, early 1900s um i don't want to go into all of the details of that but it's just an it's just also then another way through which these first steps into connecting kind of everyday life with actually a species through a mode, mode of storytelling and performance and guided visual meditation that started to then influence that little snippet that you saw today of the work that's situated currently in Loon and, and will be there until this 3rd of September and, and as I mentioned informs the workshop that's also going to be part of it. Um, and carrying on from that sort of kind of work then um, a lot of my work is often site-based, which is also something I can speak a little bit more about the, the kind of way in which the exhibition works or the, the, the work works <laughs> at Loon at the moment. But uh, this, um, I guess, stepping into then these processes of guided visual meditations, slight energy kind of work using on and offline um modes of comms 
and telling stories then of soil technology, urban space, all of the stuff that Aoife kind of introduced as my like palette, let's say, of, of things that I'm interested in. And how to kind of tell stories around the soil and the species and the plants that we are sort of around was beginning then to also kind of go deeper in works such as Eulogy to the Soil, which was situated in the outskirts of Paris um, in a garden that actually had been a very in a very industrial area and actually the whole all of the soil was uh, quite um, damaged and the gardeners then had about you know many 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 years of re remediation soil remediation to, um, to kind of practice in order to bring the the garden into its current state and and they did this through multiple different plants um, and again telling not just only the story of the soil and, and, and the processes of cleaning it then, but how some of those plants that were now part and parcel of that remediation process, how their journey actually also um, happens in, in terms of not only being in the garden, but also has been used in different ways in different kinds of countries. Um, and then, yeah there's there's lots of kind of pieces to this particular performance because uh it was situated within the art there was a whole uh kind of altar so to speak to the plants that have been doing this remediation work and the screens behind it which um sort of informed also the installation that is in Lewin was essentially this max patch which is a, a kind of a computer program that allows you to do various different audio visual techniques and it just ran through the the uh, the the process that we built into the kind of dissolve of the image was kind of quite important so that this image is broke is breaking up in front of you and allowing for a kind of a gentle space to emerge that both recognizes what the plants and the species have been doing and the soil has been doing in that space saying goodbye allowing for a kind of a meditative context to emerge that allows one to sort of lament or let go even if that's felt consciously or not and then also connecting this to kind of sort of more hopeful futures as well where there might be other ways to sort of think through what's the next steps within this evolution of a kind of harmony with the earth in this particular kind of manner. Um, and as I mentioned, this sort of processes of guided visual meditation then have sort of been developing um, in different kind of context here. This one is around what's in my pocket and it guide, guides you through all the minerals that are essentially in, in your mobile phone and, and the backstories to some of those. Um, which evolved a bit further into kind of mineral compression. And again, thinking through the kind of context of um, acknowledging labors that are also involved there. Many of the minerals that are also in our phones, you know, at least a couple of them are, are, are what they called kind of blood minerals, so to speak, and in that there is wars uh, being fought over them because they're highly valued, et cetera. So just acknowledging, acknowledging this kind of, um, geopolitical kind of labor conditions that people are in when, when, when we also kind of are receiving our tech. And then also this work as it was de developing, I started to kind of realize that, and I'm speaking here when I say start to realize, I'm starting to realize about my own understanding of some of the species that are around me that I very rarely understand their full reproductive cycle. And what does that mean to actually appreciate the reproductive cycle of another species that you're kind of engaging with on a day-to-day -day level and when i say engaging with on a day-to-day -day level it, i mean in your visible spectrum on a day-to-day -day level like do you know the life cycle of an oak or do you like you know the tree or the, the the plant that's in your garden and you might if you're involved with it but you you might not really pay much attention to that um, and I certainly don't myself, or I wasn't myself on 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 such micro micro levels, particularly if I'm not um, cultivating the plant in some way. 
And so this idea of using guided visual meditation techniques then to bring people into a scenario where we think through that life cycle of the plant allows you to sort of maybe appreciate the species that are around you a bit more. And in that kind of context, you might start to think, well, actually, you know what, that plant only flowers every four years, or actually, I shouldn't be going near this, you know, grass or rush in these months, because actually, that's when it starts to, you know, reproduce or survive, or it's doing, it's, it's, it's in a very important phase within its life cycle. Um, and some of these kind of conversations around the reproductive uh, life cycles of other species was also tying into notions of sort of the aesthetics that we have trained ourselves to really appreciate in a sense or not appreciate or what we think is rough and wild and dirty and not neat and all of that sort of stuff. And I, you know, other people have also been speaking about this in that we do actually need to almost decolonize the eye in terms of appreciating what we sort of see as beauty in, in a sense, particularly in, in, in relation to, to nature. Um, and so these were some of the other thoughts that started to get developed um, in 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 2000 and uh, in 21 with this calling into the now where this particular uh site which i've been working a lot with in in berlin um has a whole number of reads around it and so the guided vid visual meditation brought people into the reproductive cycle of the read and at, coming out of that meditation process then people would write a short story of what they might have felt in that moment during the meditation and then those stories are gathered and kind of almost create a poem that is performed then as uh, as an honoring to the read um, which is what you sort of see here um, with the drummer and and the, the the textiles here which were actually all created um, from the site and from the reeds within a 24 hour period and developed in the water from the basin and, and so forth. So that all of these kind of elements of the work start to actually resonate from the site itself. Um, and so I guess connecting uh, this also then those practices of ritual and care to this work that I do around repair cultures, this notions of aesthetics of breakdown and aesthetics of failure and and holding on to this trouble in a sense when things are detaching and falling and breaking down and you know they are always in that process we've all we're always in a constant uh flow of change in our lives but we, we as humans are not very good at dealing with change and 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 it's actually fundamental to some of our developmental parameters that we have stability but it also can lead us to feel quite chaotic but this from a material culture's perspective again many artists like Kim Cascon who's a musician has been writing about this notion of things you know actually kind of always glitching in a way and that technology and I and I think this is what's what the point I kind of want to make here is that the seamlessness of technology in the last 20 25 years the seamlessness of getting onto the internet and having a phone and we got has kind of creates this illusion that there isn't anything no barriers you know there that there's a kind of it's 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 a the last stages of capitalism in a sense where there's ultra extraction happening and there's no kind of like border control so to speak um and steve jackson who's a science technology scholar has speak spoke speaks about this and again in relation to material cultures again in relation to kind of technology about these points of where things break down and when you see where things break down Geographers such as Graham Thrift and, 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 and um, Nigel Tripp, sorry, and, and Stephen Graham would speak to these are the cruxes, these are the points where you actually really see what is happening in life, what needs to be maintained, what needs to be privileged, what are the care processes. And I think COVID more than anything revealed this for for you know thousands of us <laughs> simultaneously, you know, what what actually 
is the labors, the daily labors that are kind of going going on and, and, and what is really actually necessary to sustain life. And so there's a turn really in the last, I don't know, 15, 15 years, so to speak, but really in the last 10 years and this emphasis theoretically and practically on things such as repair, care, maintenance and healing cultures. And I guess that's kind of where and you know, where I opened up this conversation saying that in this 2016 to 2018 period of my work life and art making and, and, and academic work, I was kind of, com these things were kind of coming into a sort of a fruition uh, and amalgamated in, this, in the establishment of Repair Acts as a, as a program, uh, an artist led uh, research and practice program that sort of looks through these this lens and looks through these intersections between artistic practice and theory and and where we are societally and culturally with with many different things on the basis and the premise that it's necessary to reimagine where we put ourselves as humans in 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 the kind of ecosystems that we're around decentering this human position or what some people will call imagining a more than a human position which is sort of still very human centric in my view but but nonetheless it's trying to kind of imagine that we're not in the center of the web so to speak and so repair acts which sort of started at um, in bristol at the university of the west of england where i also work as a professor in the art school here um was then established in westmeath and in 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 and is situated in, in clebegan and in the county um with the last year uh the last year and a half of work being we only set it up there in in, in the beginning of 2021 um, and it emerged out of some of the Creative Ireland climate action work and in partnership with Dr. Al McLavin at UC, the University College Dublin um, and many other artists and so forth. And you can check out the website for further details about that. Um, but I'll just show a little clip here of a documentary that we made also that was speaking to um, some of those practices um, in relation to repair, but from a from material cultures and a skills perspective um, in Westmeath. Culture is about why we repair something in the first place. Who repairs it? What kind of skills are needed? How the thing is made in the first place, the materials that it's made of. And then also the laws and legislations that govern the life cycle of that object or thing. So we're continued to do this work around um, uh, repair and, and, and restoration and healing cultures in, in Westmeath and working closely with Westmeath County Council as well um, around some of this work. And part of that work was also gathering a number of sort of almost crowdsourcing statements around how people would think through more restorative material cultures within the county and and this crowdsourced document in a sense led to um the 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 the, uh, the first repair declaration in a sense for ireland um based in the county in terms of what people would actually sort of like to see and 
some of these calls and demands are a mixture of, you know, aspirational statements as well as very practical interventions such as, you know, reduced tax obligations on maybe repair businesses or mobile repair units for rural parts of the county, etc. Um, but a lot of that work then happened last year and, it, and we're now looking towards how we can implement um, in the coming years um, aspects of this. But one of the things that really came across within that within that work was the close relationship that many artisan heritage repair practitioners have, of course, with land and landscape and their own very beautiful wisdom and innate knowledges um, around working with local kind of materials. And, and that working with local materials, one of the main people that we spoke to about their work was the Thatcher John um, Colin, um, Colin, sorry, in, in, in Glasson. And John um, was also very knowledgeable about the, the reeds in and speaks beautifully about that within the actual documentary. Um, and so again, this working with the, the reeds from Westmeath was and from Offaly and from the Midlands then sort of uh, has kind of informed some some of some of the work that I'm doing at the moment, including the piece that you see it in in Loon, and um and I think what you know was was kind of an accident really in a sense uh, to to I say accident but you know I guess chance doesn't happen to the prepared mind but like the invitation that came from Loon coincided with a lot of these thought processes sort of landing and the work that had been done in the previous ritual online projects I was thinking through how to kind of create something that could actually enable a more a more um gallery based piece but also one that could sort of tour so that if it moved to another location for example, a similar botanical illustration of a of a species that is no longer in the area could could actually be used and enable a community to have this meditative space, really, and just creating a point of under of of of, of perhaps even closure, even if it is many decades ago that the the plant is not there, and the intersecting elements I guess here to say are that the, the the installation itself you know which has its roots in that earlier work the eulogy to the soil um the 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 current the current work with the for the exhibition in Loon was to kind of stabilize that back-end system that would support that 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 development of the, of the work but then also started to kind of, as I had mentioned, looked into looking into the funeral practices in different cultures. And of course, keening is a very common uh, historical aspect. I mean, some people may still practice it, but broadly considered as a historical heritage practice in Ireland and 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 um, and found myself in sort of in this point where I understood, I guess, a bit more clear that keening as as a as a as a way and a wailing in Irish funerals sort of began to sort of die out in the 50s and across the 60s of course in some parts it survived for longer as I said it it, it still may be in 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 used in 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 popular places in, in a popular way should I say but for the most it's 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 pretty specialist and that intersection then with the death of an actual mourning song or process which was often tied well I mean both men and women practiced and 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 were often paid even to come into a funeral and sometimes those people were also traveling gypsy communities um you know different characters maybe in a community took up that role and from what I understand from some of the research that was sort of stamped out for various different reasons partly also to do with you know uh patriarchal structures uh not really feeling that 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 was a useful or a uh, 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 a useful thing to do in the funeral and the power then that was taken away perhaps from you know um the church 
in holding a ceremony. And I and those kind of, I guess, unexpected intersections between modalities of industrialization alongside then these sonic traditions, funeral traditions, and, and the power games in a sense that are at play if you really like want to scrape these things back um, to what is at, you know, is at play, I found were really kind of quite interesting and sort of provided another layer then of meaning that kind of comes through for me at least in the installation and and that keening song that you heard is a, a short some short phrases that I sort of borrowed from research into different sort of phrases that people would sing um in an atonal kind of old kilter way and so the piece in Loon essentially runs for six hours of the gallery opening so to speak and over the course of the duration of that it's on it the image is on a 10 minute loop which sort of dissolves as you see over time and some of the ways that it dissolves also every time the loop starts again it the dissolve starts to happen in a different place because essentially climate change is not going to be evenly distributed and so you get this other layering then that's happening in terms of how we are going to perceive these changes because some of them are going to be significantly visible and felt aka a heat wave or a tsunami or you know a drought and then some of them will just be the small disappearances of plants like like the pollock rush and other sort of uh, elements as well and the sonic composition, which actually lasts over that six six hour period as well, um, starts to cut out and glitch at different points. So this sound sonically actually starts to break down too over over time, which is a further further nod to that. And there's a small print then that is what the just acknowledges the name, the Latin name, the English name, aka the Scottish name of the plant and its translation then also into Irish and 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 that print itself was also created on a set on with the letterpress collective in Bristol which is run by Nick Hand and Nick essentially goes around the country and had gone around the country to collect and is donated often letterpresses that are left um and extinct in a sense or the person who was running them dies and he kind of has become a go-to person in the UK for those. And so the, actually the hand printing of the, the, the name of the plant in the gallery is also a nod to other, you know, handcraft forms of practices that are actually also, you know, on those point, points of brink and extinction and unfolding worlds and, and each, each for me, each one of these things opens up a world of, 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 of another world of making. What they are world making things in themselves, and they lend us to kind of, I think, question perhaps maybe what these notions of progress and and innovation um, actually really is, and what is actually the sacrifice that we are making, which is again loops back to the point that these theorists thinking through the notions of failure, degrowth, breakdown, um, repair, etc., are all kind of uh, speaking to. So I hope that gives you a bit of a flavor of <laughs> some of the things that are kind of sitting behind the, the piece and um, and uh, um, yeah, happy to see you perhaps on the 2nd of September for, for the uh, meditation and the guidance through this uh, very beautiful little little rushes life cycle and and the dream poems that we might create from that which will then become part of of, of the archive and repertoire of works that i'm building up in in relation to this particular kind of practice um i'm going to stop there i realize that might tighten on time um but hopefully that gives you a sense and happy to take questions.
Thank you so much, Teresa. That was really, really, really fascinating. Um, I know I certainly have a question or two, but um, I'll hand it over to anybody who might have a question if you want to pop on your audio and video, or you can just type into the chat if you prefer to remain faceless, that's okay. <clears throat> Great, thanks, Amy. So Amy Barry says many thanks, Teresa Dillon, for the fascinating and interesting talk. Thank you so much for joining. Um, just, just a question there, Teresa. Thank you very much for for for, for talking to us about this. It's, it's very fascinating, and uh, I was interested about something you mentioned about um, the calling in the now rituals of the read in Berlin, and you mentioned that there were some from there there were some short stories mentioned, or even a poem that mentioned. You know, so where can we read these short stories or poems? Is there somewhere that we can can look at, or you know, is there? Um, yeah, I haven't published them because they. Um, I haven't published them. They were they were written. Um, within the, within the group post the meditation and then edit it and then used as the text for the performance right. um, and then I haven't published any of these texts yet actually um, but uh, it, it's kind of forming a sort of a small body of work now because there's a few of these that I've sort of carried out um, including the upcoming one in in loon and um but i uh, i'm actually writing a book chapter at the moment uh, around this around this where some of them will be referenced but there's no one one point um if anyone out there wants to <laughs> yeah. i'll be very mm -hmm. interested to attend that september mm -hmm. you know event that you mentioned and you do keep us posted on that yeah Thank you. And thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, does anybody else have any any questions or uh, even just insights? It doesn't necessarily have to be a question. I always kind of come away from a talk with more so kind of conversation starters. Unfortunately, we don't have the time for that, but sometimes it's nice to share. <laughs> Um, Ed Coyle has said uh, you gave us plenty to work on and food for thought with this newer policy now to come into operation if passed by Strasbourg if these bogs can be rewilded and not drained now I'm not familiar with that myself but maybe you are Teresa yeah well I think that I mean the the restoration of the peat bogs in the Midlands um you know it's not a, it's uh it's something i'm aware of because of colleagues that are working on it but i think it's it's um i think it's really uh it's really about time in in some ways because they are our carbon sinks you know it's a bit they're a bit like you know fighting for the amazon in the same way they play a very important role and i think perhaps that role which was acknowledged even when they were being industrialized um yeah like yeah could plants be reborn yeah I, it it's difficult because the way the bogs are formed anyway in the first place you know it is it is these it, it's kind of why I opened up with that sort of section that quote from the the um Anna Singh and colleagues that the the things that are being sort of unraveling at the moment take millions and millions of years to actually form in the first place you know so I mean I am hopeful about rewilding I am hopeful about all of these things but um perhaps that it, it's um yeah it it we should be I guess um manage expectations of what kind of would would also be possible with some of those interventions as well but I think it's great that that uh, the Midland bogs are changing their, their into into new sites. Absolutely, uh, Carmel has a question. Uh, it's more a comment really than a question, Teresa. And thanks a million. I I really could listen to you all day. It's such an interesting subject, but it's great to get the research background to the work. Um, it kind of just gives you I think a you know more comprehensive picture of where you're coming from as an artist but just in terms of the rewilding I don't know if anybody heard this week but there was 
raging debates on, on national radio about rewilding in Dublin and in particular around Trinity. So it's, um, I suppose it's, it's very topical at the moment, but I agree with you, Teresa. It's amazing to see this natural habitat that we have here in, in the Midlands, you know, being treated now with respect and hopefully, you know, that sentence that you said earlier about like it took millions of years to create things and in the blink of an eye, it's gone. So hopefully, you know, through through the work that's starting to happen now, that people will actually, you know, start thinking of the future in a different way and rewilding might be just one of those things but I, I think it's really important that the arts are involved and we're just thrilled that the timing was right from Loon Gallery's point of view and your point of view as well because I think it's an amazing exhibition and I hope that everybody that logged on today has got the opportunity to come in and see it because it's it's very um meditative but <laughs> it really makes you contemplate as well uh, but also think of you know as in the title thank you Aoife um, it really does invoke that notion of change and hope and looking forward and uh, hopefully even some of the things I think it was Ed that said you know maybe there will be an opportunity to rewild and and some species that have become ex extinct possibly you know who knows who knows what's in the future but anyhow thank you Teresa sorry I'm rambling on a little bit here <laughs> no worries thanks Carmel yeah um lovely thank you Carmel um so I suppose we could probably wrap it up there I'm aware of the fact that we're a little bit over time um but a minister said has the repair program in Westmeath gained much traction what is the website url again please yeah it's just repairx.ie and um yeah we 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 will be continuing it it has it has gained some traction um I mean the part the first launch of the project was over last year we did about 40 workshops across the county we had a four-day exhibition in Kebegan and then also the 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 documentary turning the collar um which is uh beginning to tour a bit more in different parts of europe at this moment in time and uh, you know i think partly like working with lewin i would sort of see as some of that as an extension of these kind of thinking because this is how we actually also met you know through this program as well and there's there will be other uh workshops and events that we'll be doing um in the winter season this year as well so the plan is to kind of continue it and that's the hope also i think of westmeath county council um and you know i guess just with the with the bogs as well i think it's you know it's it's interesting to because at the moment with the just hold the just transition program that's kind of happening within the area um you know many 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 people worked in the bogs in in ireland um particularly within the midlands as well and and and, and have memories and relations and um it employed people and it, you know there's there's also this sort of side of 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 um of such kind of tensions really in a way with the landscape and 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 living you know landscape and living in a sense and i think that um with hopefully there is a possibility with like works that kind of think through this repositioning of what it means to be a human living in one's landscape that pieces that acknowledge the loss of some landscapes is just like part and parcel of what we do you know that it doesn't become something rarefied or just in a gallery that it actually does become um some cultures have that anyway as part of their practice but um um i think this is kind of one of the one of the things that is sort of um interesting to imagine in relation to all of these kind of conversations of what does it mean to live in different ways um with climate with landscape and with other species absolutely absolutely um just a note from, um, I suppose, as the curator of this exhibition, um, what I found, I've always felt that it would be, but what I find to be quite successful is creating these sensory and these tangible elements of things that are quite up in the air. And 
um, ideas and concepts that you can't really grasp a hold of because there's no real strong sensory element to it. Like we're all quite aware of the fact that there's climate catastrophe occurring and we're all quite aware of the fact that certain species are lost forever and, you know, areas in the world are really impacted by uh, temperature fluctuations et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately in our heads, it kind of reverberates as this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's no real tangible point for us to connect to. So with the visual arts then, and with your work, Gajo, I find that it really is a great anchor for us to become involved and really become, um, uh, through sensory means, uh, connected with the reality of what um, is happening with the climate catastrophe and what is happening to so many species that um, we call part of our home. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they are there no longer. Um, and creating that holding space, as you said, mm -hmm. um, and with your background in psychology, to acknowledge the fact that there needs to be a space within which you acknowledge that loss and really sense it and you see the face of the death and um, that has occurred um, and it's a vital step in the processing and acknowledgement of what is lost and to acknowledge that is the first step I believe in then coming out of that shock or freeze state and going forward into the um, reactivation fight really getting into the guts of it um, and fighting for, you know, um, a better world. Um, so thank you for your really beautiful work and for your talk today, which gave so much insight into it. It was fascinating. Yeah, thanks, Aoife. I think that really brings it around in this circular kind of, yeah, thinking practice mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely it comes in circles doesn't it and sometimes yeah. as an artist and researcher we tend to go down certain strains and then we realize actually it connects right back to what we had started with but in a totally wonderfully different way so it's nice to be able to yeah <laughs> make the loops yeah, yeah absolutely. make the loops keep making the loops <laughs> great um so um I suppose unless you have anything uh to wrap up with Teresa no and just thanks again and look forward to seeing you all in on in September for the um meditative space on 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 the on the Pollock Rush. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to that. So again, that's the second of September in Lewin Gallery. And um, details will be on the Lewin Gallery website and social media channels and will be emailed through our newsletter. Um and I think it'll be really interesting. I quite like quite open creative writing prompt workshops like that so I think it'll be actually really fruitful yeah, I hope so too thanks for your time bye. okay thanks so much Teresa and thanks everyone for joining us today um I hope you enjoyed it right bye now <laughs>